Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It's Jerry again with the research vessel Calypso. In this video, I'm going to be discussing uh, a few subsystems on the, uh, the boat that uh, aren't particularly intuitive to figure out. Uh, and a few of them serve no real purpose other than to just be, f uh, they're fun to fiddle with. Um, so we'll get started. Alright, so the first thing we'll discuss is the diver prep room. Uh, which is located on the aft portion of the main deck here, behind these double doors. And this is where your divers would go to prepare for any dives uh, that they would be conducting. And on the outside here, on the shelving, you'll notice uh, six sets of uh, scuba gear. And in here, behind these doors and these lockers, is your deep diving equipment. Uh, now you'll notice that you can actually glitch, glitch through the door to gain access to them. But if you want to do it the way I intended, uh, you'll have to open the doors. And as you can see, they do not work. This is because I have simulated a, uh, a pseudo uh, compressed air system. Uh, deep divers don't dive with oxygen usually. They usually use some combination of uh, mixed air. Uh, back in when they did uh, a lot of diving, they used a combination of helium and oxygen called heliox. Uh, and they would mix that air and the helium aboard Calypso. And they used two compressors located down in the annex uh, made by Junkers for uh, compressing air aboard U-boats. Cousteau uh, had them fitted to the, the boat, and we will need to turn those on and activate them so we can com store compressed air, which will become available to us, and we can then open these locker doors. And as you can see on this regulator here, uh, they're both reading zero, so we have no compressed air stored. So we'll go down to the annex and uh, turn those compressors on. So I'll be back shortly with you. All right, so we're here in the annex, and uh, before us we have our first compressors, the Junkers 4FK115. Uh, to turn it on, all you have to do is turn this key, and you'll hear it uh, start compressing air. This is the starboard side. There's two uh, tanks, one hiding behind the 60 kilowatt distribution panel. The other's located here. As you can see, it's storing air in liters, and that uh, pressure is climbing. The contents is uh, increasing, I should say. These gauges are, uh, while accurate readings, they uh, don't mean anything. Don't worry about them. They're just there for looks, for aesthetics. On the port side, we have the uh, other compressor, which we will turn on as well. And it'll start filling these two tanks located here. All four tanks, uh, each one holds a 1,000 liters of compressed air, which will just be displayed to you on this distribution panel located here. Uh, at the bottom here we have a bleed valve. Uh, this will drain the air from all four tanks uh, to the atmosphere if you wish to drain them. One thing to keep in mind with these compressors, uh, they do draw a lot of electricity. I have both main engines in a very high idle right now, so I don't have to worry about uh, electricity uh, for the purposes of making this video. But if you're underway and uh, the engines have a low RPM and they're not producing as much electricity, uh, you will have to be mindful of uh, that these two compressors do draw uh, quite a bit of electricity when running. They will automatically turn off when each tank is filled to a thousand liters, uh, but if they go below a thousand liters, they will turn back on again automatically. So it's just something you have to keep uh, in mind when you're using them. I would recommend turning them off, not only for that reason, uh, to save electricity, but also because they get kind of annoying when they're on all the time. Uh, so keep that in mind when you are uh, compressing air for your divers. At any rate, I will allow these tanks to fill to a thousand liters and I will get back with you uh, for what to do next. Alright, so we're here. Uh, the starboard side compressor is just shut off because it's reached a thousand liters and the port side won't be far behind. Uh, so I'm, just because I'm, I'm not going to wait for it, I'm going to turn it off now. So we now have on the port side one uh, 917 liters stored in each one of these two tanks, and on the starboard side we have a thousand. Again, I would recommend turning these off so they don't automatically turn on, and move up, and I will join you back on the uh, diving prep room. All right, so we're here in the diver prep room, and if we look over at our regulator here. You can see that uh, on the starboard side, I've got 2,000 liters of uh, stored compressed air. Uh, in the interim of making the video in a, an off cut, I accidentally bled some air off, but uh, you can see we have uh, 1,618 liters stored on the port side. 
At any rate, I will open the uh, locker now, and you can see we can gain access to our diving equipment. However, you'll see that uh, while I have the door open, the uh, pressure is dropping on the port side. Uh, and it'll continue to do so as long as I have that locker door open. As soon as I close the door, the pressure will drop uh, for a little while uh, and eventually stop. This is again to simulate uh, air being stored. Uh, and this will continue to happen every time you open the door until such time as you don't have any more compressed air, at which point you will be unable to gain access to the lockers again and you'll have to go down and uh, start the compressors and uh, go through the process again. And that is how you use the uh, Junkers uh, 4FK, the 4FK Junkers compressors, and uh, gain access to your diving equipment. All right. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is the F hold here. Uh, it has several doors on it. Uh, each one is controlled by these dogs. In real life, uh, this is how it was done. They each they had in small little doors that they would put over uh, the aft hold. They would then cover it with a tarp to make it watertight. Unfortunately, you can't do that in Stormworks, and uh, this compartment is not watertight. So if you are in high seas, and uh, you will, water will fill this compartment. Uh, when I've tested it uh, while building the ship, I found that the ship would remain afloat with this uh, the aft hold compartment fill full of water. Uh, but handling is poor and there's no guarantee that the ship won't capsize if the storms get worse or continue uh, and uh, the bow will ride very high in the uh, in the water so best thing I could tell you to do if at all possible uh, is head for shallow water and avoid storms when possible which is accurate uh, these small boats these minesweepers were not designed for uh, surviving tsunamis or uh, and they wouldn't go out to sea in, in uh, squalls or bad storms and Cousteau himself and his crew uh, made great took great pains to avoid storms whenever possible which is why uh, they had so much sophisticated uh, weather monitoring equipment aboard and had access to NASA satellites uh, particularly when they went to the Antarctic so they could avoid these storms uh, so the best thing I can tell you to do is avoid storms whenever possible. However, storm works, the weather will creep up on you, and uh, you'll find yourself in a situation where you will have to take uh, uh, reactive measures to uh, pump the water out of this compartment and hopefully save the boat. So I will go through those now. All right, so we're down in the engine room, down in the engine room, looking aft into the uh, aft hold compartment. Uh, if the weather is bad. Uh, first thing I would recommend doing, and I would do this anytime you uh, have the ship running, uh, is have the bilge pump turned on like I do here. Uh, this will pump gray water out of the bilge, which includes shower water or the uh, water, like I mentioned in the engine tutorial, uh, salt water from the sea chest uh, out of the boat. If the uh, weather is poor, first thing I would do is close the aft hold. This will isolate the aft hold from the rest of the ship and uh, keep any water from passing from there into the rest of the boat. If you leave that hatch open, water will flow into the engine room, down into the bilge, and into the rest of the ship, and it will sink. Uh, the bilge pumps cannot keep up with that kind of water, and uh, you'll be in the uh, lifeboats uh, in no time at all. Uh, when the storm has subsided, uh, this compartment obviously will be full of water and you'll need to get it out. What you can do is open the uh, aft hold or the drain you can open this valve which will drain the water to the bilge in a control controlled manner and the uh, bilge pump will be able to keep up with it and uh, remove that water from the aft hold uh, in a controlled slow manner and uh, you'll be able to gain access to that compartment again uh, if you do have the uh, Galazi uh, submersible decompression chamber or the SP350 uh, submarine aboard, I would recommend keeping those hatches closed uh, on those uh, vehicles as they do offer some buoyancy. Uh, if they are allowed to fill with water, uh, it can be difficult to A, get the water out, and of course it will make uh, the, the ship heavier and more likely to uh, go down in the stern. If the water rises above the, uh, the hatch, the aft hold hatch, uh, no amount of uh, pumping of water will uh, drain that compartment and you'll be forced to uh, make way for uh, the, the dock and uh, 
somehow get the water out. I think you'll just have to restart and uh, call it a day. And uh, that is the simple way, and really the only way, to uh, control flooding aboard Calypso. Alright, the next thing we want to talk about is the uh, distiller, the freshwater distiller, and the water heater. Uh, I touched on it briefly in the engine tutorial, but we'll go in a little more depth with it now. Uh, this system is used uh, not only for the showers, but also to create heat. Uh, this heater that we were recently provided with in Stormworks is an electrical heater. Uh, Calypso didn't have, as far as I'm aware, uh, electrical heaters. They used radiators, which of course use hot water, hot fresh water. And that is provided to you by the fresh water distiller. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous video, it does uh, consume quite a bit of electricity, so you need to make sure you're producing quite a bit of uh, power for it while it's running. So I'll go ahead and turn that on. Uh, it'll begin charging the uh, system, which is why we're showing a negative pressure right now. You can hear it running. And we'll move over to the port side of the ship in the engine room here. And uh, make sure the feed water, uh, uh, the water heater feed pump is on. I already have it on. Uh, and it'll start uh, filling the, uh, the lines going from the pump to the water heater in the bow of the ship. And eventually it'll start filling the fresh water uh, tank, which you can use to store the fresh water and uh, use that for uh, while you have the distiller off. If you don't have fresh water, you will not have heat. Uh, so that's something you need to be aware of when you're in the Arctic or preparing to go to the Arctic. Uh, I would recommend having cold weather clothing on while you wait for uh, fresh water to be uh, produced. Uh, and it does take a long time to fill this tank, a very long time. Uh, the distiller is not fast. So keep that in mind when you're uh, preparing uh, your missions for the Arctic. I will now move to the uh, bow of the ship and uh, show you the water heater and how it operates. Alright, so we're now in the bow uh, cabin passageway. I'll turn on some lights here so we can see. And we're going to move down into the aft hold, which is through this cabin here. Turn on some lights down here. These are for the uh, fore hold and the passageway to the crew cabins. Get out of the way of the uh, tiller control cables there. Open the aft hold. And inside here is our water heater, which is beginning to fill. However, it's not on, so if you go turn on the showers, you'll be taking cold showers. Uh, the uh, radiators will work, or excuse me, they will not work. You won't have access to hot water in any form, so the radiators will not work. So what you need to do is turn on that breaker. This will now activate the water heater, and you will have access to hot water. If the water level drops below 15 liters, you will be unable to uh, have hot water. That simple. And you can see how slowly the uh, the system fills the water heater. Once the water heater is full, it'll fill the lines going back to the uh, freshwater uh, reservoir or tank and begin filling the tank. And now we'll move up and now I will show you the thermostats and how they operate. All right, we're now in the four cabin passageway again. And uh, up here we have our four radiator thermostat. Uh, in order for this to work again I, we have to have 15 liters of water stored in the water heater the water heater has to be on and you should have water coming to it because it does consume uh, fresh water you can turn it on and you'll probably notice nothing will happen if you have the doors open all the doors in the fore part of the ship including the hatches must be closed this includes the bridge uh, you can have them open for up to 10 seconds before uh, heat will dissipate from the compartment and you will no longer uh, be able to heat the compartment. So uh, you're not born in a barn. Keep your hatches and doorways closed. As you can see, now the heater is on. All right, the other method for getting warm is uh, to take a warm shower. Uh, there's three showers aboard the ship. There's two in the very bow of the ship where I am, on the shower and uh, headroom. There's also one in the captain's cabin. Uh, which I'll let you find yourself. But you come in here, and all you got to do is turn on the shower, and uh, there you go. The heater will come on momentarily. There it is, and we're now getting warm. The showers consume quite a bit of water. 
uh, very quickly, quicker than the radiator does. So you have to be mindful of that. In fact, follow the sign here. Take Navy showers. If you don't know what that is, Google it. Uh, and that is how uh, a couple of the methods you can use to stay warm outside of wearing uh, cold weather clothing. One last thing I forgot to mention, the aft radiator is located here in the uh, mess hall. Uh, and you can turn that on and gain heat for the back half of the ship. The aft hold is not heated. Uh, you will not be able to stay warm in that compartment uh, it's, as it is exposed to the uh, atmosphere and the environment. Alright, I'd also like to show you how to use the uh, deck crane, which was lovingly referred to as Yumbo. Uh, as far as I understand, they pulled it off the back of a truck. Uh, for use aboard the boat. And they use this for lifting uh, not only the submerged decompression chamber, uh, but also the submarines uh, out of the water, into the aft hold, and vice versa. Uh, and it has a compressor system as well, which I'll now go over. I've gone ahead and uh, opened all the, uh, the, the doors to the aft hold, which you can now lower yourself down into. You can see the mountings for the SDC and the uh, submarine here. But over on our side here, we have the compressor. Don't worry about the uh, the oil tank here. That's just a number. It's never going to change. Over here, we have the uh, Yumbo compressor power. We'll turn that on, and we'll turn on the compressor. The ready light will come on, and you can hear the compressor running. And we can now operate our crane. To do so, first thing we need to do is uncage the uh, travel lock, and you can now uh, operate the controls uh, and uh, use the crane, however you see fit. One thing to keep in mind, if you are lowering uh, anything into the water, and you're going to be using the crane later, uh, and you want to save some electricity, I would recommend turning the compressor off. Uh, it will retain its electricity, particularly uh, to its connectors, so if you have uh, anything connected to it, it will uh, continue to, or it will remain connected. If you shut off this breaker, while you have something connected to the crane, it will drop to the bottom of the ocean. Keep that in mind when you're using it, and be careful not to turn the breaker off. And that is how you use the uh, compressor for, and the uh, Yumbo deck crane. All right, so the last thing I wanted to discuss was uh, some of the systems on the bridge and the ready room, uh, which may not be all that intuitive to use. Uh, some of them are just for fun and serve no real purpose whatsoever. Uh, others are functional, but not particularly functional. So we'll, we'll go through a few of those and how they operate. Uh, on the bridge here, you do have a working radar, uh, albeit not the greatest. For it to work, you need to have the power supply on. Uh, the system will warm. Uh, this is to simulate, uh, if you're American, vacuum tubes, or if you're from the rest of the world, you call them valves. Uh, it gives them time to warm up. Once they're warm, the ready light will come on. You can then come over to your PPI scope, turn that on, and hop up on top of the stand here, and you can now use the radar, which displays in most of the traditional manners that you've seen in uh, other radars that people put in the workshop on their ships and their creations. Uh, it does use electricity, so be mindful of that. We'll move down into the radio room, turn the light on, and uh, there's a few systems on, down here I wanted to go over. The others I'll leave you uh, leave it to you to figure out. But uh, over here we have a side scan sonar. Uh, in the workshop associated with all the other Calypso downloads, you'll see a little side scan sonar fish. Uh, you hook it to the crane on the front of the ship, uh, which uh, there's a picture displaying of that now and you turn this control on and uh, it will display readings from either side. It's not particularly useful, it's mostly just for fun. You might be able to spot uh, large uh, formations of rocks under the water with it out to 250 meters from either side, uh, but that's all it's really for, it's just really for fun. To use this, uh, any of the systems aboard Calypso, you will have to have this uh, key uh, cut in. This provides uh, 60 kilowatt power to the radio room, which you can now see displayed here. 60 kilowatt power available, and the voltage is being provided, and that's just a simulated value. It's not real. 
Uh, we can then come over here. And if you wish to use the Yagi antenna, which is located on the roof of the uh, radio room, you can uh, do that by turning on the radios and the range finders and all that fun stuff. And then you can dial in uh, a channel with the Yagi antenna. You can do it manually uh, with this control here. Uh, otherwise, click on this keypad here. And you'll see zero equals the satellite tracking is off. Uh, if you'd like to track the NOAA 2 satellite, you type in number 2. And the uh, Yagi antenna will begin spinning and beeping. And that's all it does. Just there to make some noise. The Intel Sat 3 satellite is number 4. And it is now tracking the uh, Intel 3 satellite. You can use this satellite uh, to send and receive information. So if you come over here, uh, if you'd like to use your NASA picture viewer, which again doesn't really do anything, it'll just beep at you. In real life, they use that to receive pictures of cloud formations from NASA and their, uh, their stations in Florida uh, that they used, uh, particularly when they went to Antarctica. If you'd like to send a fax of some fish that you discovered and you took pictures of it, you can do that by pushing this button on the Muirhead fax machine. Uh, for those who are not familiar, this is how fax machines used to work in the 70s. Uh, instead of a flat surface that you put the picture on, you put it on a reel and it spun it around and uh, would take the image and send it off via the Intel 3 satellite. And that is how you use the, and that is how you use the uh, Yagi antenna.